Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Thursday, September 10th, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Uh, today, my teleprompter decided it was not going to join us for this episode, uh, so you may see me looking down a lot. Apologies for the technological fail. We expect to have that problem fixed for tomorrow. So over the weekend, I, um, I saw one of the most confusing and horrifying weather warnings I have ever seen. I wasn't looking at the multiple cyclones and weather depressions in the world's oceans. I was looking at the state of Colorado, which um, it was experiencing both massive wildfires and also snow. Over the course of 24 hours, the temperature dropped 60 degrees in some places. And there was the potential for both fire tornadoes and snow tornadoes and just regular tornadoes. This is an unprecedented fire season that is currently being experienced across all of North America's West Coast. The thing is, we're currently living a climate change horror movie. If you tried to write a script that had all the things we're currently experiencing, it would either get funded by people who do crazy movies like Sharknado or poo-pooed as too over the top to be real. But this is our reality. And um, it also turns out that unlike in movies, Instead of facing climate change head on with scientists gathering together to work things out in high tech environments and figure out how to launch or burrow or otherwise do the thing that's needed, we're pretty much facing it in our pajamas, in our homes, while also dealing with a global pandemic. Now the thing is not everyone is watching quietly. People are working hard to try and come up with solutions. And in the latest issue of the journal Nature Astronomy, researchers from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy looked at the interactions between astronomy, astronomers, and our climate, and reminded all of us across six different journal articles that there is no planet B. This is the only one we've got. As we as astronomers and planetary scientists look toward Venus, we see a world that was potentially habitable and may even have supported life as recently as 700 million years ago. We see results there of a runaway greenhouse effect triggered by the massive release of carbon dioxide through un some unknown mechanism 700 to 750 million years ago. Our own world is currently experiencing its own massive release of greenhouse gases, both from the machinery of modern life and also from the melting of tundra and the release of greenhouse gases that were previously locked away in the ice. Well, it is too late for us to stop the melting of the permafrost. We can at least work to mitigate our own human impact. And astronomers, it turns out, are really bad for the environment. Researchers looked at both how astronomers have a particularly large carbon footprint and also at how we're particularly impacted by the atmospheric changes we are helping to trigger. Mm -hmm. On the carbon production side of the coin, the Mass Planck Institute for Astrophysics added up the Institute's 2018 carbon, foot pit, fo carbon footprint for all research-related activities. The dominant carbon source, it turned out, was internet intercontinental travel to attend conferences and to travel to observatories to take observations. As, some, as someone who 
As someone who flew pre-COVID, typically 80 to 100,000 miles per year, I am as guilty of doing this as any of those Max Planck Institute scientists. And um, as I traveled from place to place, I saw the same people over and over, city after city, as we traveled the world. Prior to COVID, advancing a research career meant you had to travel. It meant giving talks at conferences and introducing yourself and your research to the world at podium after podium. It meant walking around conferences to start conversations with people doing similar research so that you could build new collaborations. It meant, well, interacting. And if you didn't interact, if you didn't travel, well, research would stagnate. And without name recognition, grants wouldn't get funded. We have essentially designed our profession where being on national and international committees is part of what's required to get tenure at many universities. We essentially require carbon emitting travel to advance careers. Beyond issues with travel, the researchers found that the computational nature of so much of what we do in astronomy, um, where we're using supercomputers for many of our models and calculations, using core after core, GPU after GPU, well, we're responsible for a disproportionately large amount of electricity consumption. Putting all these pieces together, research and research-related travel was responsible for 18 tons of carbon emission per researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. This is twice the amount of carbon a typical German citizen, the Max Planck Institute is in Germany, so this was the best comparison. This is twice what the typical German emits through all their work and day-to-day life-related activities. And this was the researchers' research-related consumption alone. <sighs> With this increased release of greenhouse gases, we're seeing increases in the temperature of our planet. Place-to-place um, -place temperature variations are different. Overall, since the Industrial, industrial Revolution, our planet has seen a roughly one degree Celsius increase across the planet. Some places have seen a larger increase, and because of that, this means there's also places that have had a decrease in temperature. That's how averages work. Place-to-place -place temperature variations change. And at the Paranel Observatory in Chile, home of the Very Large Telescope, the greatest optical telescope system on our planet. They have seen a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius over the past three decades. This makes it harder to do science there. We need to maintain the insides of our telescope facilities at the temperature that we expect to see in the middle of the night. And with this increase in temperature, we're also seeing an increase in sunset temperature. We're seeing greater temperature fluctuations. And all of this leads to thermal noise, to turbulence in the air around our detectors that degrades the images that we're trying to take of the most distant parts of our universe. In addition to these temperature variations that just makes it harder to maintain our instruments and do excellent science, we're also seeing changes in the atmospheric quality with increased frequency of El Ninos, which are an increase in the temperature of the Pacific Ocean off the coasts of Ecuador and Peru along the equatorial region of our world. With that increase in open temp ocean temperatures, we see an increase in the humidity over Chile, 
an increase in the amount of water vapor in the sky. And water vapor absorbs out certain wavelengths of light, especially infrared radiation. This means that some of the colors that we're trying to observe don't make it to our telescope detectors, not in the same amounts they used to, making it harder again to do our science. Now, in the grand scheme of things, these are the least of our climate change concerns. These challenges are minor when you look at the hurricanes that are destroying communities, when you look at the rising waters that are consuming cities. Heck, Indonesia is planning to move one of the world's mega cities, Jakarta, to a different island because Jakarta is sinking into the sea. Still, it may be easier for us to get astronomers to reduce their travel post-COVID. Um, if we can get our community to recognize that we are part of the problem that is affecting our observations, which we need to do our science. Sometimes you have to take the problem home to people, show them how they are specifically being impacted. We have to, as a community, to say, we have to, as a community, say, we need more and better virtual meetings. We need more and better ways to network online and provide ways for our early, thank you so much for that. Um, we need to find new and better ways for our online communities to support networking so that early career researchers can collaborate successfully. We need to find ways for people to advance their careers without advancing out of their houses. As we all sort how to get through this coronavirus pandemic, this is getting forced on us. This is actually a good thing, sort of, in a really bad way. Um, not just astronomers are working on this problem. And I can only hope that we've that as we define new and better ways to work remotely, we will become better stewards of our planet. Again, this research is addressed across six different articles in Nature Astronomy. All right, I don't know about you, but climate change is one of those things that leaves me feeling a great deal of despair. I can't offer you much hope for this world, but I can tell you of another world, a world named Bennu. It's the one that's up on the screen right now. Um, Bennu has a compulsion to throw rocks. Back in January 2019, planetary scientists noticed in image after image that there were pebbles seven millimeters, quarter of an inch in size, flying away from the surface of this half kilometer across asteroid. Some of these pebbles escaped forever out into space. Some gravitationally settled their way back down onto the asteroid. Um, these observed paths actually allowed us to do some really unexpected science. Um, according to Steve Chelsea, the particles were an unexpected gift for gravity science at Bennu, since they allowed us to see tiny variations in the asteroid's gravity field that we would not have known about otherwise. Yes, folks, these researchers looked at the paths that pebbles took as they flew around Bennu, flinging up, falling down. And in these trajectories, they were able to see the point-to-point -point variations in Bennu's gravity field. This was entirely unexpected and is quite delightful. Now, the source of these far-flung rocks remains a bit of a mystery. It looks like a combination of thermal fracturing and impacting meteors, or one or the other of these effects may be the cause. Um, in the case of thermal fracturing, we're looking at the constant heating and cooling of rocks, causing the rocks to fracture and the release of energy during this fracturing event flings the flakes, the pebbles, off into space. In the case of meteors, 
space is literally throwing rocks at Bennu. The energy of those impacts is then causing Bennu to throw pebbles at space. I just find this delightful. As a reminder, on October 20th, the OSIRIS-REx mission is going to attempt to steal rocks or at least pebbles, gravel, and dust from the surface of Bennu. And we're going to bring you live coverage of that event on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. Um, as a final note, yesterday the Department of Energy announced that Berkeley Laboratory has been selected to lead the construction efforts of a massive network of large and small telescopes that will be built in Antarctica and in Chile. Um, these telescopes are being designed for the purpose of observing the cosmic microwave background radiation from the surface of the Earth using more new detectors than are currently in use by the world's entire professional astronomy community. This project is best described as audacious. And because of its scope and potential to both generate amazing space science and suck all funding out of the rest of space science, we're going to be following this project from start to finish. Um, this is something we rarely do because so many projects get canceled, but when something of this size comes along, such as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the Vera Rubin Observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope, Mars Curiosity, these massive projects we do follow. Um, here are the fast figures. They will use 21 telescopes at two sites with 500,000 ultra-sensitive detectors to study the cosmic microwave background for at least seven years. The initial announcement didn't include cost information, but this project is funded jointly by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. Some digging is going to be required to figure out just how much this project is going to cost. Stay tuned. This story is getting more attention as details become available. All right, that rounds out our news for today. This has been The Daily Space.